Chapter 1 That's the ugliest baby I've ever seen. Teddy and I are standing in the entrance hall of our school, PS38, in front of a bulletin board covered with a gajillion baby pictures. I've never seen so much pink and blue in my life. <laughs> Which one? I chuckle, peering over his shoulder for a closer look. That one! What? Hey, wait a minute! That's me! It is? Teddy says. He's trying to act all shocked, but I can tell by the look on his face he knew it was my picture all along. Yep, that's Nate, all right, says Francis, walking up behind us. Notice how he's trying to put a square peg in a round hole. Plus, he's drooling. Francis and Teddy are my two best friends, which might surprise you considering how they're ragging on me about this baby picture. But that's just the way the three of us operate. They both know it's only a matter of time before I find something to bust their chops about. It all evens out in the end. Well, what about you, Francis? I say quickly locating his photo on the board. I had no idea you wanted to be a sumo wrestler. Francis shrugs. Hey, all babies are kind of chunky, he says. Where do you think the phrase baby fat comes from? <laughs> from your picture, obviously, snorts Teddy. <laughs> I bet your picture isn't any better, says Francis. Yeah, Teddy, which one's you? He waves at all the photos on the board. I'm here somewhere. Try and find me. Before Francis and I give Teddy a tag team noogie for being so obnoxious, maybe I should explain what's up with all these baby pictures. This is Mrs. Shapolsky's bulletin board. She's the school secretary, and she's in charge of what goes on it. Usually it's covered with lame posters that say things like, Join the math team. It adds up to fun. Or, Don't be a litterbug. Keep our school clean. But last week, Mrs. Shapolsky decided to try something different. Here's what happened. One day in the office. Is that a picture of your kids, Mrs. Shapolsky? No, that's me and my sister when we were babies. This is you? This doesn't look like you at all. I know. Many people don't look like their baby pictures. Hmm. Ba bing Night! You've just given me a fun idea for the bulletin board. Suddenly, a monster comes in. Roar! Yeah! Actually, that last part didn't really happen. I just wanted to jazz up the story. Anyway, that's how the PS38 Guess That Baby game got started. Mrs. Shapolsky asked every single kid in the sixth grade to put their baby picture on this board. Some of these are so easy to guess, Francis says. Is there any doubt that's Chad? Nope, and there's Chester, Teddy says, pointing at another one. You can tell it's him because of the mustache and the tattoos. Francis says. I'm not really listening to Teddy and Francis. I'm scanning the board from left to right, searching for one specific picture. There. Sandwiched between a couple of kids having really bad hair days, that's her. Aha, I say. Who'd you find? Francis asks. Take a look, I say. Francis and Teddy step up to examine the picture more closely. They look confused, as usual. I give up, Teddy says finally. Who is it? Isn't it obvious, I say. Those beautiful blue eyes. That cute little button nose. That's Jenny. Jenny's the most awesome girl in the whole sixth grade, and someday she and I are going to make a great couple. Unfortunately, she's going out with Artur at the moment, which is kind of a drag, but that'll change. The point is, I'm a Jenny expert. I recognized her right away, I go on. She's the best-looking baby here, by far. Ahem! Are you sure that's Jenny? Ugh. Look who just oozed in. Gina. How is this any of her business? Of course, I'm sure. I snap at Gina. I'm positive I'd know Jenny anywhere. 
Oh, really? Says Gina with an obnoxious little smirk. Well, maybe you don't know her as well as you think you do. She marches over to the board and starts pulling the picture off. Hey, you can't do that! I shout. That's not yours. Gina walks toward me. Well, if it's not mine, she asks, then why is my name on it? She holds it up close to my face. There, written on the back, I see Gina Hemphill Toms, age fourteen months. Gawk! I blink hard and look again, hoping that maybe I read it wrong. But there's no mistake. This isn't a picture of Jenny. It's Gina. I feel like I just got clubbed on the forehead with a Louisville slugger. Conk! Ouch! With a nasty grin, Gina throws my own words back at me. The best looking baby here, by far. Wow! <laughs> Teddy and Francis explode with laughter. So do some other kids who've started to crowd around. And there's nothing I can do about it. This is like one of those bad dreams where everyone else has clothes on and you're in your underwear. Gina puts the picture back, then walks away, waving at everybody like a stinking prom queen. Thank you, thank you. You're wonderful, all of you, except you, Nate. I might just puke. Here I am, standing in front of half the school, looking like a visitor from Planet Moron. But I can deal with that. I've done it before. What makes this the absolute pits is knowing that it was Gina who got the best of me. Gina's one of my least favorite people. No, more than that, she's one of my least favorite anything's. Check out my list. Things I can't stand by Nate Wright Esquire. Cats, especially when they haven't been declawed. Egg salad. Social studies. School picture day. Click what? Hey, I wasn't ready. Crusty, dried-up erasers that don't even work. They smudge everything. Standardized tests. Being sick during the weekend. Math. Oldies music. Figure skating. Bubble gum that loses its flavor in twenty seconds. Barbers who have no idea what a little off the top means. Squishy bananas, shopping, Gina. Ah, another A plus. What did you get? Paper cuts, parent-teacher conferences, any art project involving egg cartons or pipe cleaners. That makes it pretty clear, right? When you're comparing someone to egg salad and figure skating, that's about as low as it gets. Oh, how I hate her! Oh, come on, says Francis. You don't hate her. Yes, I do. I growl. Well, just remember what they say. Teddy says with a smile. It's a fine line between hate and love. They say. Francis snickers. <laughs> you two will make a lovely couple. He says when he finally pulls himself together. Yeah, you're made for each other. Teddy says. I'm about to knock their heads together, Three Stooges style. Kabunk! When the bell rings for homeroom. I'm no fan of homeroom. Hey, it's ten minutes of sharing oxygen with Mrs. Godfrey. But I'm all for anything that'll shut up Francis and Teddy. In I go. I've made a new seating chart, everyone. Mrs. Godfrey says. Check the board for your new seat assignments. New seat assignments. Fine, whatever. I don't really care where I sit. I just want class to start so I can put all this Gina stuff behind me. Chapter two. You're probably wondering, what's up with Nate drinking all the Gina haterade? Is she really that bad? Ah,、uh, that would be a yes. With a capital Y, it's tough to say what it is about Gina that bugs me the most. There's so much to choose from, but here's a big one. She's always talking about how great she is. Gina says, "I'm so much smarter than you are." I say, 
No, you get better grades because all you ever do is study. Gina says, I've never been sent to detention, ever. I say, translation, you have no life. Gina says, I'm Mrs. Godfrey's favorite student. I say, because you are a complete suck-up. Francis says that maybe Gina just acts like she's better than everybody else because deep down she doesn't really like herself. He might have a point. If I were Gina, I wouldn't like myself either. But Gina's taking up way too much space in my brain this morning. I really need to start thinking about something else. Quiet, class. I said quiet. Like the fact that class started five seconds ago and Mrs. Godfrey's already yelling. And now she's pulling out her blue folder. Oh, no. Mrs. Godfrey color codes everything. Her yellow folder is for attendance sheets. The green one is for homework assignments. The red one's filled with in-class worksheets. And the blue one? Special projects. And I don't mean special in a good way. In middle school, special is like a dirty word. The last time we did a special project, Mrs. Godfrey only gave me a C-plus on my Louisiana report because she said I wrote too much stuff about pelicans. Hello? The pelican happens to be the state bird of Louisiana. That was vital info. And the time before that, she gave me a lousy grade on my replica of the Colosseum because I built it out of Legos. There was no plastic in ancient Rome. Well, what did she expect me to do? Go to the nearest quarry and dig up some marble? I'm going to tell you about a new special project class, Mrs. Godfrey announces. She's smiling, which is never a good sign. Plus, whenever she shows her teeth, it reminds me of a shark attack on Animal Planet. You're going to write a research paper about a great American. Groan. Ugh, a research paper. That's a biggie. Those things take weeks to do, and they usually count a ton toward your semester grade. And, she continues, what, there's more? This is not a solo project. You'll team up with other classmates. Yes! Finally, some good news! I look over at Teddy and Francis. I can tell we're all thinking the same thing. We jump up from our chairs and head straight for the front of the room. Mrs. Godfrey, can the three of us work together? She looks like she just smelled something foul. I don't think so, she says. Special project fact. The only time she let the three of us work together, we built a model of Mount Vesuvius and accidentally splattered her with fake lava. Whoops. First of all, you will be working in pairs, not groups of three, she says, sounding like she expected us to know that already. And second of all, I'll be matching students randomly. Randomly? Teddy says. <laughs> like Nate taking a multiple choice test. Francis says, Poink! She pulls out a cookie jar from her bottom drawer. Not that there are any cookies in it, of course. She probably ate them all. She sure didn't offer us any. On each of these slips of paper, I've written one of your names. I'll select two names at a time, Mrs. Godfrey explains. The classmate you're paired with will be your partner for this project. Wow! This is like one of those lottery drawings on TV where a babe picks numbered ping-pong balls out of a giant fish tank. That's tonight's lucky numbers. And now, here's Wink Summers with the weather forecast. Except Mrs. Godfrey's not using ping-pong balls. And she's not a babe. The class starts buzzing. We all understand the stakes. You could end up with someone great or... You could get stuck with a total dud. The best partners are pretty obvious. Francis or Teddy would be fantastic. Getting paired with Jenny would be beyond awesome. And of course, whoever gets paired up with me is hitting a major jackpot. But in every class, there are always a few kids like this. Worst potential project partners. Number five, Nick Blonsky. Doesn't get much work done because he's too busy 
digging for gold. Number four, Kim Cressley wants to be more than just project partners, if you know what I mean. Let's cuddle now. Number three, Tabitha Burke. She never says anything, which is sort of freaky. Plus, she blinks about once a day, which totally wears me out. Uh, hello? Hello? Snap, snap. Number two, Mark Cheswick. Not exactly the sharpest knife in the drawer. And he smells like socks. I don't get it. Number one, Gina Hemphill Toms. Think of the most annoying person you've ever met. Then multiply by about a billion. Can we have extra homework? The suspense is killing everybody. What's the hold up here? Mrs. Godfrey's just standing by your desk, staring at us. Silence. Oh, I get it. She's doing that thing teachers always do when they get all quiet and wait for the class to figure out that it's time to shut up. Finally, she reaches into the jar and picks out the first two slips. Kendra, she reads aloud. And Matthew. I shoot a quick look at Kendra and Matthew. They don't exactly look thrilled, but I'm pretty sure they both realize one thing. It could have been worse. Mrs. Godfrey continues. Brian and Kelly. Molly and Allison. Jenny and Artur. Kim and Nick. Cindy and Stephen. Wait, hold it. Rewind. Did I hear that right? Jenny and Artur are partners? Great. Those two are practically joined at the hip as it is. Now they'll be spending even more time together. This is an outrage! Teddy and Francis. Oh, come on! First Jenny and Artur, and now Teddy and Francis get to work together? Look at them over there. They're acting like they just want a trip to Disney World. Yes! Whap! Lucky stiffs. But what about me? I scan the classroom and do some quick calculating. There are only a few names Mrs. Godfrey hasn't chosen. Katie, Chad, Audrey, Mark, Gina. My stomach does a swan dive down to my shoes. Gina hasn't been paired with anybody yet. Oh, please, no. Please don't let me get stuck with Gina. Anyone but her. Mrs. Godfrey reaches into the jar again. Nate and... Not Gina, not Gina, not Gina, not Gina, not Gina, not Gina. Megan! We you! What a relief! I'm fine with being Megan's partner. More than fine. Megan's pretty cool. She's nice, she's smart, she's... She's... She's not here. Megan? Anybody seen Megan? Oh, wait! Says Mrs. Godfrey. I just remembered Megan's having her tonsils removed this week. She'll be absent for a while. That means you'll need a different partner. But, but I don't mind waiting until Megan gets back, I stammer. I'll just... Quiet, Nate, Mrs. Godfrey barks. Before I can get another word out, she's got her hand back in the cookie jar. You'll be working with Gina. No. No. No! Is there a problem, you two? Mrs. Godfrey asks in a tone that makes it clear there better not be. No, Mrs. Godfrey, Gina says. Not at all. Typical Gina. She says exactly what the teacher wants to hear. But I can't pretend everything's fine and dandy when it isn't. Mrs. Godfrey's eyes look like they're about to burn a hole in my head. But she asked if there's a problem, and I'm going to give her an answer. The problem is, we don't want to work on the project together. Really? She answers, sounding surprised. Well, I can't imagine why. I think the two of you will make a wonderful team. A few kids snicker. Mrs. Godfrey turns and starts writing on the blackboard. That's her way of telling me this conversation is over. There's no way out. I'm officially partners with Gina. Isn't that special? Chapter 3 I'm so mad at Megan's tonsils.
I grumble as Francis, Teddy, and I stop by our lockers. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have to be partners with Gina. Right, says Francis. I'm sure that was all part of Megan's master plan. Let's see, how can I ruin Nate's life? I know, I'll have surgery. Okay, okay, I say. You don't have to make it sound so stupid. Yeah, Francis, Teddy says. Nate did that already. How about I remove your tonsils, I say. Well, Mrs. Godfrey won't let you dump Gina, Francis points out. So you might as well make the best of it. Easy for you to say, I shoot back. You're not the one stuck with her. Stuck with me, Gina says. I'm the one stuck with you. Having you as a partner could ruin my spotless academic record. Ugh. Gina and her precious academic record. I've only heard this about a thousand times. Thank you, crowd. Thank you. Here's a little ditty called, I Have a Perfect Grade Point Average. <clears throat> Plink, plonk. Oh, I never worry, I never fuss. In every class, I get an A+. Plus. Book, report, project, quiz, or test. Whatever I do, I'll be the best. Audience. Boo! The song stinks! She's so conceited! You know what, Gina? I could do as well as you if I really wanted to, I tell her. Then why don't you? Because, I answer. There's more to life than good grades. Yeah, Teddy and Francis chime in. Like bad grades and detentions and walking around with your zipper down. Zip. Listen, Einstein, Gina snarls. When you're working with me, grades and life are the same thing. Our paper topic is Benjamin Franklin, she says slowly. Think you can remember that? I don't answer. Actually, I can't answer, what with Gina strangling me and all. Finally, she lets me go and stalks off toward, shocker, the library, her home away from home. Mrs. Godfrey was right, Teddy teases. You and Gina do make a great team. I'm about to hip-check him into the water fountain when... Team? Team! Guys! I say excitedly. It's Tuesday! Pause. Congratulations, says Francis. Did you figure that out all by yourself? Today's the day Coach posts the captain's list. That perks them up. We head for the gym as fast as we can. We don't run, because if you get caught running in the hallways, you get detention. So we just walk super fast. Scoot, 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 scoot. Even though it makes you look like you need to go to the bathroom really, really bad. Great timing. Coach is putting up the list just as we're race walking around the corner. Intramural fleece ball captains. Helen T. Reed M. Nate W. Becky L. Randy B. Matt P, Hannah M, Peter R. Captains will select teams after school today. Yes, I'm a fleeceball captain. There are two kinds of sports at PS38. The official ones you play against other schools like soccer and basketball and lacrosse, and the unofficial ones that you play between seasons. All the teachers call them intramurals, but the kids call them spoffs. Sports played only for fun. I've got to be honest. They're not played only for fun. You're playing against kids you've known your whole life, so it can get pretty intense. It's more than sports. It's bragging rights. And there's a trophy. It's the sorriest looking thing you've ever seen. But spoffs are such a big deal, a long time ago, somebody decided there had to be a trophy. So they wrapped some aluminum foil around an empty Dr. Pepper can and called it the Spoffy, the most idiotic name for a trophy of all time. I want to win that stupid thing so bad. I've just got to. My spoff career has been a disaster so far. It's not my fault. I just keep ending up on lame teams. Nate's Spoff History 
Volleyball. Half our team was afraid of the ball. He's going to spike it. Duck. Floor hockey. Our so-called captain, Debbie Sorvino, filled the roster with all her annoying friends. And so I told her, yak yak, you did, you go girl. Excuse me, there's a game going on. And the one time I was actually on a half-decent team, dodgeball. Good news, we made it to the championship game. Bad news, so did the other team. Pow! Chester's ball speed, 100 million miles per hour. So obviously I've never won the Spoffy. But here's why this is my big chance. First, I'm a captain. That means I get to pick my own team. It's not random like that cookie jar thing in social studies. Second, I'm really good at fleece ball. But if you don't have fleece ball at your school, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. Fleece ball is indoor baseball. Most of the rules are the same, except instead of a baseball bat, you use a broom handle. The ball's puffy, so it doesn't hurt if it hits you. Last year, Chad got drilled right in the face, and he was totally fine. I didn't even feel it. And one more thing. It's not a good idea to slide when you're running the bases. Four burn! Squeak! What's the score? Wood one, skin zero. You're going to pick me for your team, right, Nate? Asked Teddy. Of course I am. As long as another captain doesn't pick you first, I say. Speaking of other captains, look who's coming. Randy Betancourt. Ugh. Randy's a bully. He walks around acting like he owns the school. And he's always got a posse of five or six guys trailing after him like a bunch of pilot fish. And I don't even think they like him. They just pretend to like him because they're afraid of him. Step aside, scrubs, he barks at us. Then he checks the list. He does a little fist pump when he sees his name. Yes! Then he looks at it again and turns toward me. Coach made you a captain, he says. I thought captains had to be good at sports. Is Randy trying to trash talk me? Fine. Bring it on. I am good at sports, I tell him. But it takes more than that to be a captain. Like what, he sneers. I'll show you, I say. Follow me. I lead Randy and his crew down the hallway. I sneak a couple of looks over my shoulder to make sure they're still with me. So far, so good. We stop. Okay, I say. Hold it. Don't move. What's this all about? Randy demands. I told you I was going to show you an important part of being a captain, I say, turning toward my locker. Here it is. I open my locker and... Boom! You've got to be able to outthink your opponent. Randy tries to say something, but he can't. He's too busy getting crushed by the avalanche of garbage that just exploded out of my locker. I guess being a slob has its advantages. He'll probably kill me later, and maybe his fleece ball team will totally destroy mine. But right now, I really don't care. I went up against the biggest jerk in school, and I won. And here comes Principal Nichols. Randy! Your locker is a disgrace! But this isn't my clean up this mess now. Score. Chapter four. News travels fast in middle school. It took about five seconds for the whole sixth grade to hear our eye pung to Randy. Mr. Big Shot isn't used to getting laughed at, so he's probably got one thing on his mind. Revenge. How Randy might try to get even. The locker treatment. I showed him my locker, so he'll want to return the favor. There's plenty of room, shove. The high-low wedgie. High. Yank. Low. Foomph. Remind me to start wearing a belt. The pig pile. This is when Randy's posse becomes even more annoying. Oof. The swirly. 
Time for a little underwater exploration. Flush! <laughs> Way to go, Randy! He's been looking for me all day, but he'll never find me here. I'm in the library. Any sign of him? Nope. I wasn't planning to be in the library. Five minutes ago, I was in science, my last class of the day. But then things got a little out of hand. That seems to happen to me a lot. It started out okay. Mr. Galvin said we were doing an experiment about energy. That was funny because Mr. Galvin and energy don't exactly go together. Magnetic fields. Hydrochloric acid. Argyle sucks. Anyway, we each got a little car and a board to use as a ramp. We were supposed to keep changing the angle of the ramp and measure how far the car rolled each time. This time it went six feet. whoop de do Guess what? The steeper the ramp, the farther the car went. Duh. What's next? Doing an experiment to prove water is wet? The whole thing was a day trip to Camp Boredom. And then... I got the idea to liven things up by customizing my car. Snip, snip, cut, tape, tape. I turned it into the Batmobile. Pretty cool, right? So then I figured, why stop there? I went ahead and made a Batman mask. Come on, Robin, there's trouble afoot in Gotham City. Yeah, it was probably a little goofy, but I was getting laughs, and it was making science Fun for a change. Until... What on earth are you doing? Ever notice that teachers always ask what you're doing when anybody with half a brain could figure it out? I didn't know what Mr. Galvin wanted me to say, so I decided to go with Old Reliable. And... nothing? I guess Mr. Galvin's not a big Batman fan. His jaw muscles started to twitch, which always means trouble. I expected him to launch into one of those screaming fits where his voice gets all weird and shaky. But he just gave one of those, I'm so disappointed in you, size, and said, If you're not going to apply yourself during class, why don't you spend the rest of the period in the library? The library? I didn't see that one coming, but hey, fine by me. I cleaned things up, headed for the door, and then the other shoe dropped. And Nate, said Mr. Galvin, come see me after last bell. Shoot. It's bad enough getting yelled at during school hours, but getting chewed out on my own time? That's gonna stink. Still, it's better than sitting in science watching Mr. Galvin's arteries harden. The library's my favorite hangout spot in school. It's perfect for table football. There are hardly ever any teachers here, and best of all, beanbag chairs. Flump. I snuggled deep into the chair. Ah, this is nice. I'll just relax here for a while and... <clears throat> I assume you're here because you have work to do. Oop, it's Hickey. Mrs. Hickson, I mean. She's the head librarian and she's not really into hanging out. Mrs. Hickson fact. She never forgets a name, a face, or an overdue book. Old Yeller, the Phantom Tollbooth, Holes. I'm pretty sure the beanbag chairs weren't her idea. If you're in her library, she wants to see you doing something. Um, yeah, I'm doing research on Ben Franklin. Well then, she answers, wouldn't a book come in handy? Librarians. Aren't they hilarious? We have several Ben Franklin volumes on that bottom shelf. <sighs> Thank you. Great. So much for my date with the beanbag chair. Instead, I'm stuck reading about some guy who's been worm food for a couple of centuries. Except, you know what? This Ben Franklin dude was actually pretty cool. Before now, all I knew about Ben Franklin was that A, he was kind of chubby, and B, his picture is on the hundred-dollar bill. But it turns out that he did all sorts of amazing stuff back in colonial times. Basically, the man was a genius. Like me. 
I open my binder and start taking notes. Ben Franklin fun facts. Guaranteed 100% true. He only had two years of formal schooling. How lucky can you get? Ben taught himself to swim at age seven. Cannonball! Not many people knew how to swim back then. Unlike many of the founding fathers, Ben did not usually wear one of those wussy powdered wigs. Bald is beautiful, baby. When the city of Philadelphia had a coin shortage, Ben was hired to design and print paper money. Now I can pay myself. Guess who invented bifocals, the Franklin stove, and lightning rods? Instead of the bald eagle, Ben wanted the national bird of the USA to be a turkey. Nice try. Nate, calls Mrs. Hickson from the front desk. The bell rang. It did? Wow. I got so wrapped up in my work that I didn't hear a thing. Ack! That sounds like something Gina would say. I hurry toward the science room, hoping Mr. Galvin isn't there. Maybe he went home. Maybe he forgot about me. Ah, oh, Mr. Wright, come in, please. No such luck. Nobody likes a show-off, son. When you call attention to yourself during class, it blah, 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 blah. Whoa, hold on. Did he just call me a show-off? That is so bogus. I wasn't showing off. I was just trying to make science a little more interesting. Or did Mr. Galvin miss the fact that his little car and ramp experiment was a total yawnathon? School is serious business, Nate, he continues. It's not fun and games. Fun and games. Fun and games. Games! The captain's meeting! Oh, no! I'm supposed to be in the gym right now. I have to pick players for my fleeceball team. I break into a sweat. Mr. Galvin's still flapping his gums, but I can't just stand here and wait for him to shut up. I've got to do something. I'm really, really sorry, and I promise it'll never happen again. Silence. Okay, mission accomplished. He stopped talking. But did I just make things worse? All right then, Nate, he says finally. I accept your apology. Your dis- Zoom! Missed. I'm out the door and on my way to the gym at about warp ten. Forget that whole no running in the hallway rule. This is an emergency. Coach, I'm here! I made it! I'm afraid you're too late, Nate, Coach tells me. The captain's meeting is over. Over? I say, my heart sinking. I feel my chance to win the spoffy slipping away. But, Coach reads my mind. Don't worry, Nate, he says with a smile. You're still a captain, and you've got yourself a team. Here, I picked your players for you. For a second, I feel a little twinge of disappointment. I was really looking forward to picking the team myself. But then I start reading the roster Coach gave me. Nate, Captain. Francis, Teddy, Marcy, Paige, Chad, Sarah, Will, Colin. Francis and Teddy are on my team. Yes! And there are a lot of other good players here, too. Wow! This team could be a powerhouse, I exclaim. Thanks, Coach. But aren't there supposed to be ten kids per team? There are only nine names here. Coach looks confused for a second. He glances over my shoulder. Move your thumb. I slide my thumb to the side. There at the bottom of the list is the tenth name. No. No! Gina! I almost gag. Is this some kind of sick joke? What's Gina doing signing up for fleece ball? She doesn't even like sports. She's going to ruin everything. I don't want her on my team. Gina, did I mention I got 105 on my math test? Random spectator. Uh, shouldn't you be catching that ball? Whoa, wait a sec. My team. My team. I'm the captain. I'm in charge. The other players have to do what I say, including Gina. Hmm, maybe this won't be so bad after all. Maybe for once, I've got Gina right where I want her. Under my thumb. Chapter 5
What's our team called? Francis asks as the three of us walk home. Nothing, I say. Wait, we're called the nothings? Teddy teases. Hey, adds Francis. There's a name that says winner. I ignore them. I didn't have a name ready when I talked to Coach, I explain. So he gave me until homeroom tomorrow to come up with one. Well, make sure it's a good one, Teddy says. There's nothing worse than being on a team with a bad name. Remember when our Little League team was sponsored by Joe's Hot Dogs? Two, four, six, eight, who do we appreciate? Weenies! Weenies! Yay! Yeah, that was pretty embarrassing. Still, we did have a pretty catchy slogan, Francis reminds us. We're on a roll! We reach my house. Well, one season as a hot dog was enough, I say. I definitely won't be giving us some stupid food name. So, we're not going to be Nate's Noodles? Teddy asks. Or Francis's French Fries? Francis adds. Ooh, Teddy adds. How about Teddy's Tacos? How about you clowns let an expert handle this? By tomorrow, I'll have the perfect team name. Gina's Gerbils, Teddy calls. Gerbils aren't fooled, you idiot, Francis says. How do you know? I hear Teddy reply as I reach the front door. Have you ever tried one? I'm home, I say. Hi, Nate, says Dad from the kitchen. How was school? Not bad, I say, my stomach rumbling. All that talk about hot dogs and tacos made me hungry. Can I have a snack? Sure, says Dad. Whatever you can find. Whatever I can find? Good one, Dad. See, our house isn't like other houses. Welcome to the No Snack Zone. Cookies? No. Chips? Never. Chef Dad says, try these yummy treats instead. Ketchup packets. Zesty Ranch Croutons, Prunes, Half a Bag of Chopped Walnuts, Three Packs of Instant Oatmeal, Ice Cubes, Liver Bites, for when I dog sit for Spitzy, Orange Marmalade, Onions, One Box of Lime Jello, The Freshness Date Expired Before I Was Born, Soy Sauce, Almond Scented Soap, Parsley, Happy Eating! This is pathetic. Would it kill Dad to keep a few bags of cheese doodles lying around? I'm about to start gnawing on a table leg when... Ring! I got it! Oop. That's my cue to go up to my room. I don't need to listen to Ellen blabbing away about all the boys who never notice her or what kind of lip gloss she's going to wear tomorrow. Hello? Oh, yes he is? Hold on. It's for you. Who is it? I ask. How should I know? Answers Ellen. She's obviously devastated that the call isn't for her. On the inside? <laughs> Why is my life such a tragedy? On the outside? <sighs> it's some girl. A girl? That hardly ever happens. The last time a girl called me, it was Annette Bingham selling Girl Scout cookies. I'm trying to figure out who it might be when a thought hits me. What if it's Jenny? Hi, Nate. I'm just calling to hear the sound of your voice. Would you like to get together? How awesome would that be? I try to stay calm as I reach for the phone. Very cool. Very suave. Yellow. This is Gina. Oh, oh. let down city. Gina's voice sounds even more annoying over the phone, if that's possible. Have you done any Ben Franklin research yet? She snaps. Wait a minute. Is she checking up on me? As a matter of fact, I have, I say. Not that it's any of your business. Not my business. My grade point average is at stake. Chillax, Gina. I'm not going to screw up your perfect record. You better not, she barks. Because any grade below an A-plus would mean I can't hear you, Gina. My phone has a low battery. Uh, what? I can't hear. Boop. 
The old low battery trick. <laughs> Works every time. Who was on the phone? Dad asks, hopefully. Uh, sorry, Dad. The only people who ever call you are telemarketers. Nate was talking to a girl. <laughs> Thanks so much, Ellen. Now Dad's going to get all parental on me. A girl, he says, raising his eyebrows. Really? It wasn't a girl, I mutter. It was Gina. Ah! And is this Gina someone special, winka winka? Okay, this is officially grossing me out. No! I yell, almost gagging. Gina's my arch enemy! She only called me because we're doing a project together for Mrs. Godfrey. Ooh! Ellen chimes in. Mrs. Godfrey? Whoops. Big mistake. I should never mention Mrs. Godfrey around Ellen because I was Mrs. Godfrey's favorite student ever. I set such a good example for the class that, see, the floodgates have opened, and now she's running up to her room and coming back with my sixth grade report card. That's a big difference between Ellen and me. She saves her report cards. I burn mine. Ellen sounds giddy. <laughs> Want to hear some of the comments Mrs. Godfrey gave me back then? Sure, and then I'll stick forks in my eyes. <clears throat> she begins. Ellen is a joy to teach. Never have I had such a dedicated student. Her sunny disposition lights up the classroom. She's an inspiration to everyone around her. This is disgusting. I stomp up to my room. If I wanted to hear someone brag about her grades, I would have stayed on the phone with Gina. Besides, I already knew that Mrs. Godfrey is the world's number one Ellen fan. She made that clear the night of the PS38 open house. Nate's true life comics. Real people, real events. I was taking Dad from room to room so he can meet all my teachers. Let's go to the art studio. Mr. Wright. Mrs. Godfrey, how nice to see you. You must tell me, how is that wonderful daughter of yours? She's fine, thank you. What a treasure she was, the perfect student, and such a hard worker. I remember one time, Ellen, yak, 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 yak. <sighs> Finally, even Dad got bored. He tried to ask a question about why we were there in the first place. How's Nate doing in social studies? Who? The end. Next episode, Mrs. Godfrey nominates Ellen for sainthood. Don't get me wrong, it's not that I really want Mrs. Godfrey to like me. The kids she likes are all a bunch of dweebs. But sixth grade would be a lot easier for me. If Ellen hadn't been there first. Okay, enough about Ellen. Thanks to her little me-fest and Gina's phone call, I haven't had time to focus on what's really important. What should I name my fleeceball team? I need a name that stands out. A lot of kids name their spoff teams after their favorite pro team. What's fun about that? Where's the imagination? I want to come up with something original. I grab a pencil. Time to start brainstorming. Potential team names from the brilliant mind of Captain Nate Wright. Felice Police. Wrecking Balls. Spoffy or Die. No Mercy. Grave Diggers. Broom Handle Bombers. Gym Rats. Going, going, gone. Wall Bangers. The Right Stuff. We're champs, you're chumps. Bring the pain! Power up! Losing is not an option. Nate Aureus. Hmm. These are good, but none of them are knocking my socks off. Maybe I'll call Teddy or Francis and... Woof, 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 woof! Holy cow. Is that Spitzy? Spitzy belongs to our neighbor, Mr. Eustace, and compared to other dogs, he's sort of lame. He wears a ridiculous purple sweater and a halo collar that makes him look like a walking satellite dish. 
He has a knack for jumping on you right after he's been rolling around in something dead. And one time, he infested my backpack with fleas. But he's never loud. I run to the window to see what's got him so freaked out. Looks like Spitzy's barking at... Roof, 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 roof. Nothing. Maybe something was there a second ago. Maybe he saw a cat or maybe a squirrel ran by. I can't see anything now. But Spitzy's still going completely psycho. Hey, that's it. Thanks, Spitzy. You just gave me a great idea. There. Let the fleece ball season begin. Remember how I said I wanted my team to stand out? Well, this is just the name to do it. It's perfect. I can't wait to tell the guys. Psycho dogs! Chapter 6 I was right. When I tell Francis and Teddy that we're going to be the psycho dogs, they're totally into it. So, the day's off to a great start. Nate! Nate! You're dead meat! Oop. That didn't last long. Randy's looking for you, Chad says. He says it's payback time. Chad's right. As we get closer to the schoolyard, I can see Randy and his little gang of sidekicks hanging out by the tetherball pole. You don't have to be Einstein to figure out his plan. But, no need to panic. I've got the schoolyard safety policy on my side. I don't think they even had a safety policy until last year. But then came the Eric Flory incident. Eric's completely obsessed with martial arts stuff. He'll be doing something normal, like standing in the lunch line, and then for no reason, yeah, hiya, he'll break into a bunch of kung fu moves. Weird. One day during recess, Eric and Danny Delfino were play-fighting in the schoolyard, doing kickboxing and karate and stuff. Ha! Ya! Hoo! Wha! It was sort of a dork fest, but I have to admit, it looked pretty real. I guess it looked a little too real. Principal Nichols had no clue they were just messing around. He started running toward them, and he almost never runs, not even in the kids versus teachers basketball game. Boys, stop! Stop it! When they saw him charging at them like a runaway hippo, it must have messed up their super kung fu concentration. They both sort of fell down. Eric landed funny. You could hear the snap all the way over by the parking lot. He broke his arm. Ew! It's bending the wrong way. Of course, after that, the school went totally overboard. They outlawed play fighting and just about anything else that's fun, which makes for some pretty boring recesses. Official PS38 list of approved schoolyard activities. Standing quietly, sitting quietly, doing homework, chatting with others in an appropriate non-threatening way, listening to teachers tell stories about their lives. And then I put butter on my corn muffin. Yoga. Poetry. Yoga and poetry at the same time. Roses are red. I'll pose on my head. Picking up trash and gently disposing of it. No throwing. Taking a nap. Group sing-along. Chad. Hey, gang. I brought my oboe. But you know what? Right now, I'm fine with the safety policy. Because it's going to keep Randy off my back. If he tries anything that even looks like we're fighting, the playground patrol will be all over him. So I'm not worried. Until I see who's on duty. Coach John. Coach John's old school. I'm pretty sure he doesn't care much about the safety policy. He's always telling us we need a little less safety. In my day, we didn't wear batting helmets. That explains a lot. If he sees Randy mopping the asphalt with my face, he'll probably just let it happen. He'll say it's good character building. So I can't count on Coach John to bail me out. And I bet Randy knows it too. As we walk onto the schoolyard, he and his posse don't even try to hide the fact they're about to ambush me. I've got a feeling I'm about to replace Eric Flory as the poster child for schoolyard injuries. I can hear it now. Remember the Nate Wright incident? Then, I get a brilliant idea. 
Run! I've got a head start on Randy, but not a big one. And this backpack is slowing me down. I can feel him gaining on me as I motor across the schoolyard and into the building. Ahem! <clears throat> Principal Nichols! Looks like he forgot to take his happy pill this morning. Enjoying your morning recreation, boys? Recreation? Excuse me, I was running for my life. But I can't say that with Randy standing only two feet away. I was on my way to... to, uh... to the computer lab, to work on my Ben Franklin project. Uh, yeah, me too. Principal Nichols isn't buying it. You're both working on Ben Franklin projects? I nod, and so does Randy. I guess he wants to stick close to me, what with him wanting to kill me and all. Well then, you both must know the answer to this question. What was the name of the popular book that Ben Franklin published every year from 1732 to 1758? Poor Richard's Almanac, I say immediately. The big guy looks kind of surprised, maybe even impressed. Very well, Nate, he says. You may go to the computer lab, and you, Mr. Betancourt, may go back outside. Whew! That was close. Randy shuffles away, looking even more like he wants to kill me. I scoot into the lab before Principal Nichols can slap any more Ben Franklin questions on me. Speaking of Ben, I wonder if he ever had to deal with jerks like Randy. I bet he did. Nate Wright presents... Ben Franklin Comics. One day in Philadelphia... Hey, Franklin, what do you think you're doing? I'm flying a kite, good sir. Nobody trespasses on my land. I challenge you to a duel. Very well. Will you hold this string for a sec? Why is this key tied to it? Zap! What a shocking conclusion. The End Bring! There's the bell. I head for homeroom, making sure to avoid Randy. Once classes start, I can sort of relax. He's not in any of my sections. It's a pretty typical morning. Mrs. Godfrey screams at me a couple of times in social studies. Ms. Clark gives us some new vocab words in English. Hey, how about extremely and boring? And in art, Mr. Rosa lets us make clay sculptures. What do you think, guys? I say, holding up mine. What's that? says Francis. A walrus? A walrus? I say. It's a psycho dog, you moron. I'm gonna bring it to all our games for good luck. Uh-oh, Francis says. Uh-oh, what? I ask, still a little peeved. Did you remember to tell Coach our team name this morning? Francis asks. Did I remember to... Gulp. Oh, no! Coach wanted that name by homeroom. I was so worried about getting away from Randy, I totally forgot. How stupid can I get? I hope Coach wasn't too mad when I didn't show up. What if he disqualifies us? Or tells me I can't be captain? Finally, the bell rings. Thirty seconds later, I'm at his office door. Coach, can I come in? Sure, Nate. Sorry I didn't give you the name of my fleeceball team this morning, I stammer. I was... Coach interrupts me with a friendly smile. No problem, Nate, he says. I got your name. Wait a minute. How'd that happen? You... you did? I ask. Right on time, he says. From Gina. Did he say... Gina? The room starts spinning. I open my mouth to speak, but nothing comes out. I'm proud of you for letting her pick the name, Nate. Coach continues. That's the sort of thing good captains do. I've got to run. I have lunchroom duty. Wait, I say as he walks out. What did Gina? I printed up the schedule. There are copies on my file cabinet, he calls back to me. I'm afraid to look, but I have to. Ah! It's worse than I thought. Worse than anybody could have thought. Gina just turned my fleece ball team into a total joke. Thanks to her, I'm now the captain of a bunch of cuddle kittens. Chapter 7 I don't care what the schedule says. I'm still going to call us the Psycho Dogs. But nobody else is. 
Hey, it's the captain of the Cuddle Kittens. Great. Coach already posted the schedule. Half the school's seen it by now, and the other half's checking it out on the way into the lunchroom. What a disaster. And it's all Gina's fault. Oh, how I hate her. I don't know how she convinced Coach to let her name the team, but I do know she won't get away with it. She's going to pay. I grab a tray in the school cafeteria. Two scoops of... <coughs> egg salad, please. Sprut! Remember my things I can't stand list? Egg salad is on it. So obviously I'm not going to eat this slop. I have other plans for it. I do a quick scan of the tables and spot Gina right away. She's sitting near the stage with her pals from the Big Brain Society. Ugh, look at that stuck-up smile on her face. Okay, Gina, let's see if you're still smiling when you are wearing an egg salad hat. I can make it look like an accident. I'll act like I'm on my way to the vending machines, and then my tray will somehow slip out of my hands. Ah, sorry, Gina, how clumsy of me. Trip! Jenny! Everything stops. The whole lunchroom goes quiet. Until Jenny starts screaming at me. What are you doing? Sorry, 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 sorry! She's not just mad. She's Godfrey mad. Her eyes look like they could burn a hole in my forehead. She scrapes some of the egg salad out of her hair. And for a second, I think she's going to throw it at me. Then Coach shows up. Jenny, go see Mrs. Shapolsky. She'll help you freshen up. Here's a sponge, Nate. Clean up this mess. Mess. That's a pretty good word to describe my day. First Randy goes after me, then Gina wussifies my fleeceball team, and now Jenny will probably never talk to me again. Idiot! Okay, she's still talking to me, so it's not all bad. I finish cleaning up and find Francis and Teddy. Smooth move, champ, Teddy says. Try to be a little less spazzy this afternoon, Francis adds. This afternoon? Uh, hello, fleeceball captain. Francis says, our first game's today. And speaking of fleeceball, Teddy says, how do we end up as the cuddle kittens? Yeah, Francis says. <sighs> I tell them the whole story. They're not surprised. They know what a pain Gina is. I'm bored, Teddy says. What should we do? I know, Francis says. Let's play the scribble game. Yes. We play the scribble game all the time. It's pretty simple. Somebody makes a scribble. Here goes. And then you have to turn that scribble into something. Okay, done. It's an elephant riding a skateboard. It's a blast. We're just getting warmed up when... Hey, Francis says. Here comes our tour. Great. Our tour. He's probably ticked off that I dumped egg salad all over Jenny. Hello, guys, he says, smiling. Hmm, guess not. Our tour probably doesn't even get mad. He's too perfect for that. I join you, okay? Sure, says Francis and Teddy together. I sort of shrug. Whatever. Don't get me wrong. I like our tour okay. But it's sort of annoying how nothing ever goes wrong for him. He's never been chased all over the school by Randy. He's never played drop the lunch tray with the whole school watching because he's Mr. Lucky. Artur, I lost your test, so I decided to just give you an A+. Young man, how would you like to be the star of your own TV show? Hey, kid, want a job as an ice cream taster? Artur, what's that sticking out of your shoe? Hey, it's a hundred dollar bill. Here, Artur, says Teddy, handing him a scribble. Turn this into something. Better hurry, Artur, Francis says. The bell rings in two minutes. One minute and fifty-nine seconds later. Okay, I'm done. It's a dragon. With scales and a personality and everything. 
Holy cow! He drew that in two minutes? Wow! That's amazing, Artur! exclaims Francis. Yeah, yeah, let's all stand up and cheer for the amazing Artur. What's he going to do next? Discover a cure for cancer during study hall? Ring! Nate, says Artur. Today after school will be fun, yes? Hmm? I am on Becky's fleeceball team. We are to play in yours, he says. Yes! Oh, really? I say casually. Yeah, that'll be fun. Fun to see Artur lose for a change. Hustle up, guys, Francis says. We're gonna be late. The afternoon's a total snoozathon. Mr. Galvin busts me for snoring during science, but somehow I make it through. The day's finally over. Let the real action begin. Fleeceball teams, says Coach, gather round. Coach goes over a few ground rules. Can we move this along, please? And then the teams split up. Okay, psycho dogs, I call out. Huddle up. Psycho dogs, says Paige. I thought we were the cuddle kittens. We are, says Gina. And here's our official mascot. Wait, what is that thing? I ask, looking at the lopsided ball of fur in Gina's hand. This is Cuddles, my oldest and most favorite stuffed animal. She's puffy, just like a fleece ball. See? I don't know how much more of this I can take. Gina named us after her stuffed cat. And listen, she talks. Will you rub my tummy? Will you rub my tummy? Somebody get me a bucket. I'm going to barf. Coach blows his whistle. Okay, killer bees and cuddle kittens, he says. Play ball! Once the game starts, it doesn't matter what our name is. We play like psycho dogs. With Teddy, Francis, and me in the middle of our lineup, we score a bunch of runs right away. But the other team keeps chipping away at our lead. Not because they're any good, but because they keep hitting the ball to Gina. No, not again! Catch it, Gina! Bonk, trip, flub! She can't catch, she can't throw, she can't hit, she can't run. Other than that, she's great! I'd love to sit her on the bench for the whole game, but you can't do that in spoffs. Everybody has to play the same amount. In the fifth inning, she commits four errors. Four errors! I'm getting madder and madder. Does she even care? Is she even trying? Come on, Gina, wake up! Tweet! Time out! Calls Coach as he walks over to me. Then he lowers his voice. Nate, do you remember how you felt when you dropped that tray in the lunchroom? Uh, yeah. Well, maybe Gina feels the same way when she makes an error, he says quietly. She's not trying to fail. I feel my cheeks getting warm. I know, I say. A captain encourages his teammates. Coach gives me a smile that makes me feel lousy and good at the same time. The game starts up again. So, what happens? Artur, who else, gets a lucky bloop hit with the bases loaded. Suddenly we're losing 9-8. We're down to our last at bats. And Gina's leading off the inning. Let's go, Gina! Let's go, Gina! She strikes out for the fourth time today. I bite my tongue. Teddy gets a double, so the tying runs on base. But then Francis hits an easy pop-up. Two outs. And I'm up. Come on, Nate! It's up to you! Relax, guys. I'm all over it. I crush the very first pitch, but it's a foul ball. The second one's right over the plate, and I take a huge hack at it. Wham! Foul ball! That's two strikes, but that's okay. All it takes is one pitch. One swing can tie this game. Or win it. It's weird. I don't feel nervous at all. I feel totally calm. I wait as the pitcher goes into his windup. Watch as the ball leaves his hand. 
Before the ball's halfway to me, I know I'm going to hit it. I grip the broom handle as tight as I can and swing. Chapter 8 Is there something bothering you, Nate? asked Dad. Huh? Oh, yeah, there's something bothering me. Right here on my plate. Broccoli with cheese sauce. I don't say that, though. When it comes to his cooking, Dad's not a big fan of constructive criticism. Besides, he probably knows it's not really the broccoli that's bumming me out. It'll help to talk about it, he says, putting on his best concerned parent face. Dad fact. His concerned parent face is exactly the same as his I-don't-know-how-to-work-the-DVD-player face. I just shake my head. No offense, big guy, but I'm not really in the mood for one of those father-son talks. Not because I don't feel like talking, because I don't feel like listening. My boy, there are many lessons to learn as we travel the highway of life. Did I ever tell you about my Aunt Gladys and her unfortunate problem with facial hair? She was... I hide the rest of my broccoli under my napkin. May I be excused? Dad finally realizes I'm not going to spill my guts. He gives a little shrug and says, Yes, you may. I guess it's nice of him to wonder what's going on. I mean, plenty of parents wouldn't even ask, right? But I just don't feel like telling him about that fleeceball game. It was two days ago, and I'm still not over it. I was so sure I was going to hit that stupid ball, and I would have if it hadn't been for Gina. Dramatic flashback! Have you ever been in the zone? It's not a place. It's a feeling. It's being 100% positive that something is about to happen exactly the way you want it to. As the ball flew toward me, I was in the zone. Everything was moving in super slow motion. I was totally focused. I knew what I had to do. And then... Will you rub my tummy? Will you rub my tummy? Whiff! Strike three! Gina! What are you doing? You made your stupid cat talk in the middle of my swing! Coach, that was interference! Or a penalty! Or a foul! Or... or... Coach shook his head. Sorry, Nate, he said. You can't call interference on your own teammate. Final score? Killer bees, nine. Cuddle kittens, eight. Nice job, teams. Arg! Game over. What a brutal ending. I wanted to take Gina's stuffed cat and rip it into a zillion pieces. But I didn't. I just gritted my teeth and went through the handshake line. Good game. Good game. Good game. Good game. Good game. Ha! Losing's bad enough, but when you strike out to end the game, even if it's not your fault, that's the only thing people remember. There's nothing you can do. You're the goat. Thanks for nothing, Nate! You lost the game! Bah! Hmm. Dad, I say heading downstairs. Hey, Dad, I can't find any clean underwear. Gawk! Nate, your friend Gina is here. Dad says. Oh, really? Hey, Dad, thanks for the news flash. Did you ever think of telling me that before I came downstairs practically butt naked? There are clean clothes in the laundry room. I zip down to the basement, my face burning. In half a minute, I'm dressed and back in the kitchen. Dad's still Mr. Cheery. I'll make the two of you some lemonade. While you entertain your guest. Entertain her? What am I, a clown? How about I just find out what she wants and get rid of her? Oh, and Nate, Dad whispers. She's cute. What? Cute? No, no, no. A puppy is cute. Jenny is cute. Gina is absolutely, positively, 100% not cute. I'll set him straight later. Right now... I have to find something out. What are you doing here? What do you think, brainless? Snarls Gina in her usual charming way. We're doing a project together. We need to compare notes. 
Here's what I've done. She pulls out a binder the size of a suitcase and opens it up. It's exactly what you'd expect from Gina. Pages and pages of Ben Franklin research. Typed. Footnotes. Timelines. I think I even saw a pie chart in there. That's fascinating, Gina. Thanks so much for coming. So long. See you later. Bye. Ciao. Hasta la vista. Chili con carne. Hold it, she says. I want to look at your work. If you've done any. She smirks. How obnoxious can you get? I've done plenty of work, Gina. I tell her coldly. Wait here. I go up to my room and grab my folder. So, she thinks she's the only one who knows anything about Ben Franklin. Wait till she looks at this. I slap my stuff down on the table. Okay, Gina. Read him and weep. It's pretty impressive if I do say so myself. There's a little bit of everything here. Awesome drawings of major events in Ben's life. 1776. Ben edits Thomas Jefferson's first draft of the Declaration of Independence. How about... We hold these truths to be self-evident instead of get a clue, you pinheads. Say, you're good. Explanations of his amazing inventions. The harmonica, a musical instrument constructed of spinning glass jars. And for my next number, I'll play chopsticks. And the real story behind some of Ben's famous quotes. Colonial Comics, starring Ben Franklin. Honey, I'm back from my walk. Woof! Zoons, Ben, a dog? He followed me home. Pat, pat. Ugh! He's jumped on our bed. Ah, that's good. He'll keep us warm during these frigid winter nights. Next morning. Why do I itch? I believe the dog is the culprit. He who lies down with dogs wakes up with fleas. Famous quote. Not in my house. Either the dog goes or I go. Hmm. Well, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Next episode, can this marriage be saved? Gina barely looks at it, then gives a little snort. <laughs> Is this a joke? She says. We're not putting cartoons in our report. What's wrong with cartoons? This is supposed to be a serious paper, not a comic book. If you stick these dumb drawings in my report, you'll ruin my A-plus average, she whines. Oh, really? Just like you're ruining my fleeceball team? I don't even want to play on your stupid team, she shouts. I yell right back at her. Then don't! Gina thinks for a second. Okay, she says. I won't, provided you don't put those comics in my report. Your report, I say. Mrs. Godfrey told us to work together. If we hand in separate papers, she'll give both of us an F. No problem, she says. I'll do the report, but I'll put both our names on it. Then we'll each get an A+, plus, and you will be out of my hair. I've got to admit, this is sounding like a pretty good plan. And you'll quit the fleece ball team, I ask. You can't just quit spots for no reason, she reminds me. Well, you're the brainiac, Gina, I tell her. Think of a reason. Fine, she nods. It's a deal. Shake on it, I say. And just as we do... Excuse me, kids. Sorry to interrupt. Dad sets the tray down and flashes us a sappy smile. Wait, does he think that... You weren't interrupt, I start to say... You two just keep on doing. Well, whatever it is you're doing, he chuckles. You obviously work very well together. Chapter 9 Poor Nate's Almanac. Price, one dollar. Our motto? Read the latest. Nate's the greatest. Welcome to the first edition of PNA, inspired by Ben Franklin, the Nate Wright of Colonial Times. Looking for up-to-date news, fun puzzles and comics, and poor Nate's words of wisdom? Then read on! Top story. Special projects do, students freak out. 
As we all know, four weeks ago, Mrs. Godfrey assigned a special project. Well, it's due tomorrow. Some students, like yours truly, have nothing to worry about, but others are panicking. Here's what some of them said during a PNA exclusive interview. Chad. I heard that last year, Mrs. Godfrey failed a whole bunch of kids. Dee Dee. This project has left me physically and emotionally exhausted. Note, member of the drama club. Kevin. I have broken out in some sort of bizarre, stress-induced rash. Some kids have asked Mrs. Godfrey for an extension, but... Sharon. She just smiled and said, No extensions, no exceptions. Hey, calm down, everybody. Remember, Ben Franklin never even made it to sixth grade. And look how awesome he turned out. Poor Nate's proverb. Why stress out and overwork when your teacher's such a jerk? And now let's see what's going on. It's time for Classroom Chatter. Did you know that you can learn all kinds of private info and juicy gossip by hanging around outside the teacher's lounge? It's true. I recently did just that, and here's what I overheard. Coach John is having some minor health problems. The doctor said it was the nastiest wart he'd ever seen. Mrs. Clark has decided to stop computer dating. And when he finally showed up, he was only five feet tall. Mr. Rosa is sort of burned out. It took me two hours to scrape the clay off the ceiling. I can't take it anymore. Mr. Galvin is very, very boring. Would anyone like to look at my vacation photos of rock formations? Hello? Anyone? Take his advice or pay the price. Ethan R. Twig. Who is this mystery columnist? Dear Ethan, in math, I sit in front of a kid whose nose whistles when he breathes. I can't hear anything Mr. Staple says. What can I do? Signed, Perplexed. Dear Perplexed, don't worry that you can't hear Mr. Staples. You're not missing anything. Answer to your problem. Throw a paper airplane at Mr. Staples. He'll get mad and move your desk to the front of the room, far away from Nose Flute Boy. Who threw that? I did. Problem solved. Poor Nate's comics page, featuring Dr. Cesspool. Good news, Mrs. Babcock. Your face transplant was a success. Wonderful. Can I take off the bandages, Doctor? Yes, but I must warn you. Your donor was not a perfect match, so your new face will look, well, different. Yeah! On the bright side, we sell razors in the gift shop. Poor Nate's four-square puzzle. Solve the clues and fill in the boxes. Across. One. Piggy blank. Two, not closed. Three, he is the coolest. Four, Mrs. Godfrey's threat. Study or blank. Down, one, Spitzy choose one. Two, Teddy is such blank blank. Two words. Three, they hang from hoops. Four, in gym we do deep blank bends. Puzzle solutions. Across, bank. Open, Nate, else, down, bone, a pal, nets, knee. Today's riddle. Question. When lightning strikes an orchestra, who gets hit first? Answer. The conductor. Spotlight on sports. The fleece ball season got off to a horrible start for the cuddle kittens, real name psycho dogs, when they lost to the killer bees 9-8. But, led by dynamic team captain Nate Wright, the KKs put that game behind them. They have not lost a game since. Highlights of the season. Snag! Teddy makes an amazing game-saving grab against the Pumas. Whack! Francis smacks a run-scoring extra-inning double against the Grizzlies. Zing! Nate strikes out 12 batters in a win over the Cyclones. And we crush the Chargers in fleece ball and trash-talking. Your team didn't deserve to win. You got lucky if it hadn't been for a couple of yak, 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 yak. Well done is better than well said.
Ben Franklin quote. Current fleece ball standings. Cuddle Kittens, five wins, one losses. Raptors, five wins, one losses. Grizzlies, four wins, three losses. Chargers, four wins, three losses. Pumas, three wins, four losses. Cyclones, three wins, four losses. Killer Bees, three wins, four losses. Roadrunners, zero wins, seven losses. There is only one game left. Cuddle Kittens, Captain N. Wright, versus Raptors, Captain R. Butt in court. This is for the championship. Winner gets the spoffy, loser gets nothing. Hey, what's your trophy like? Oops, you don't have one. Weather forecast for the big game? Who cares? We are playing inside. Tomorrow, don't miss it. You're asking people to pay a dollar for this? Asks Francis as he flips through a copy of Poor Nate's Almanac. Yep, I answer proudly. What a bargain, huh? Francis rolls his eyes. I think you should add a horoscope to the next edition, Teddy says, so people can read their fortunes. Yeah, like, here comes trouble, says Francis. Uh-oh, Principal Nichols. How come he's roaming around the hallways? Is somebody giving away free donuts? Nate! What? do you think you're doing? I'm selling an almanac, I tell him. I'm a writer, a publisher, and a businessman, just like the subject of my special project, Ben Franklin. See how I tied it in with the whole social studies thing? Is that smart or what? I admire your initiative, Nate, he says, but you can't sell your almanacs during school hours. Wait, what? But people sell stuff in school all the time, I protest. The cheerleaders sell t-shirts. Be a bobcat booster! The science club sells candy bars. It's the calcium phosphate that makes it yummy. They're doing that to raise money for specific school activities, Principal Nichols says. What are you raising money for? Uh, the Nate Wright Allowance Fund? Ha <laughs> ha Nothing. Not even a smile. Hey, Remember that nice principal who handed out juice boxes on the first day of school? Whatever happened to that guy? You may do business on your own time, Nate, he says sternly. Now put that table back in the cafetorium. He walks off, probably looking for somebody else to boss around. This must be how Ben Franklin and the rest of the founding fathers felt about King George. Then, I'm bored. Let's tax the colonists again. Now, I'm bored. Let's give the kids a standardized test. Teddy and I fold up the table and start down the hall. That's when things get crazy. I hear Chad's voice from around the corner. Hey, cut it out! And then another voice. Ah, what's the problem, loser? That's Randy. Chad again. Give it back! I have no idea what's going on, but I hear footsteps coming our way. Fast footsteps. We round the corner, and finally I see what's happening. Randy just grabbed Chad's notebook. He's running this way, and he doesn't see us. Come and get it, Randy taunts. Slam! The table hits the floor. So does Randy. I see a flash of red on his face. Blood starts pouring from his nose. This is awesome. Randy, says Miss Clark. Are you all right? Randy doesn't hesitate. He looks right at Miss Clark, points at me and lies through his teeth. Nate gave me a bloody nose! What? I open my mouth to protest, but Ms. Clark speaks first. That's not what I saw. It looked to me, she says, like you gave yourself a bloody nose because you were running in the hall. Nate was just moving a table. Randy looks stunned. Repeat. This is awesome! Go see the nurse about that nose, and after school, you may walk to the detention room. Randy hesitates. Finally, he turns to go. He glares at me as he brushes by, muttering something under his breath. What'd he say? Teddy asks. I'm not sure, I answer. Something about tomorrow. Chapter 10 Tomorrow's here already. Up and at him, Dad says. Click. You've got a big day ahead of you. Bring it on. A winner-take-all game for the Spoffy? Against Randy Betancourt? 
That's huge. So, how do you think you'll do? Dad says as I come downstairs. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Oh, we're prepared, all right, I answer confidently. We're going to pulverize those guys. There's a pause. Dad's looking at me like I've got two heads. What are you talking about? Fleeceball, obviously. What are you talking about? He raises an eyebrow. Your big social studies project? Obviously. Isn't it due today? Um, that's weird. Dad's usually clueless about what's going on at school. Now he wants to be Joe Details? I don't really want him finding out about the deal I made with Gina, so... Uh, yes, yep, it's due today, and we worked super hard on it. Wonderful! Have a great day, and say hello to that nice Gina. The guys rank on me all the way to school, but I can deal with it. Things are looking pretty good right now. Not only am I basically guaranteed an A-plus for being Gina's project partner, I've pulled it off without having to do any actual work with her. How sweet is that? We walk into Mrs. Godfrey's room, and suddenly it's a tension convention. Everybody's looking over their projects one last time, making sure they haven't forgotten anything. Which reminds me. Let me see our report, Gina. What for? She says. Duh, because I don't trust you, of course. It would be just like you to take my name off that thing at the last second. Instead, I say, I just want to see what it looks like, that's all. Fine, she says, handing it to me. Whatever. Hey, how come you put your name first, I ask. Are you serious, she asks fiercely. Because I did all the work, you pinhead. Time to hand in your class projects. Gina snatches it back from me. I'll give it to her, she growls and makes a beeline for Mrs. Godfrey. Here, Mrs. Godfrey. Why, thank you, Gina. Gag me. Look at the way they're smiling at each other. Is this social studies or a family reunion? Just hand the stinking thing in, Gina. Mrs. Godfrey starts flipping through it. Her smile slowly fades. What's that all about? Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Did she say, oh, dear? Is, is something wrong? Gina says. Her voice sounds a tiny bit higher than usual. Can you tell me about these visual aids? Mrs. Godfrey asks. I glance at Gina. She looks, well, sort of panicky. I, um, I printed some of them off the internet, and I photocopied the others from library books. Mrs. Godfrey frowns. The instructions were very clear on this matter. Visual aids are an important part of your project. You must create them yourself. Using or borrowing images from outside sources could result in a failing grade. Gina's eyes open wide. So do mine. Her Royal Highness forgot to read the instructions? Really? Hey, anybody got a camera? I want to get a picture of this. Her whole body starts to shake. Failing grade? Wow. Wow. Could it be? Could Little Miss Perfect actually get an F? These projects are supposed to be 100% original student work, Mrs. Godfrey says sternly. I'm sorry to say, Gina, that this will be a blemish on your spotless academic record. How tragic. Gina looks totally destroyed. What a moment. I'm going to enjoy this. I might never get this chance again. And Nate, Mrs. Godfrey says, turning to me, for you, this is an absolute disaster. Nope. Reality check. For a minute, I forgot that Gina and I are a team for this stupid thing. So does that mean we both fail? Well, the two of you are partners, aren't you? She says impatiently. Great. Thanks a lot, Gina. I told you we should have used my... Bing! My cartoons. I grab my Ben Franklin folder from my desk. Maybe, maybe this will undo Gina's screw-up. Mrs. Godfrey, here! These visual aids are 100% original! I can tell she's a little surprised, but she opens the folder. Gina scooches over to me. What are you doing? 
she whispers angrily. What do you think? I'm saving our butts, because in case you haven't noticed, Gina, your brilliant visual aids just earned us an F. Gina and I wait as Mrs. Godfrey slowly looks at each page. She's not just skimming through it. She's actually reading the stuff. Hey, that works for me. There's some quality material there. Like my latest comic, Ben Franklin starring in Man on the Street. One day in Philadelphia. Egad! The streets are so muddy! <laughs> Boink! I propose we pave our roads. Wow! And we'll hire street cleaners to make the city more sanitary. Great idea, Ben! And I've invented a new kind of lamp to keep our streets well lit and safe. Brilliant! Ben Franklin, you are a wonder! Many thanks, friends. What will you think of next to benefit our fair city? Speeding wagon and a team of horses. Look out! Wham! How about a hospital? Another inspired idea. End. Nate, Mrs. Godfrey says finally. Did you draw all these cartoons? She's not saying it in her usual crabby way. She actually looks happy. Uh-huh, I say. They're delightful. These really are original, in the very best sense of the word, she continues. They make this a one-of-a-kind project. Gina's losing it. Her face is all purple, and she can barely talk. Is this what a heart attack looks like? But they're just cartoons. Well, that's entirely appropriate for a Ben Franklin project, Mrs. Godfrey says. Nate, I'm sure you can tell us why. For half a second, I don't know what she's getting at. Then it hits me. Because Ben Franklin was a cartoonist himself. Exactly. He sometimes drew political cartoons and published them in his own newspaper, she explains. And Nate, she continues, I think he'd find your comics quite charming. Hear that, Gina? I say. Charming. Of course, Gina can't help herself. Can we still get an A-plus on the project? She blurts out. Mrs. Godfrey waves us back to our desks. No promises, she says cheerily. But thanks to Nate's creativity, there is a very good chance. We sit down. Gina's not saying anything. Hey, fine with me. I've got plenty to say. Well, Gina, despite your bonehead mistake... It sounds like you'll get your precious A-plus after all, I tell her. Ahem. Thanks to Nate's creativity. That's a quote from Mrs. Godfrey, by the way. She turns bright red. It wasn't all you, she hisses at me. We both contributed. Right, right, whatever you say. Oh, and Gina, there's just one more thing. You're welcome. She looks like her face might burst into flames. I can tell she wants to scream at me, but she can't say a thing. She knows I'm right. She knows that without me, her perfect academic record would have gone straight down the toilet. Who knew getting an A-plus could be so much fun? Chapter 11 You know what I hate? Waiting. It's bad enough waiting around for everyday stuff like the bathroom. Ellen, hurry up! Bam, bam! Lottie, um, goodbye, unibrow. Pluck, pluck. But when you're waiting for something really important, like our championship game against the Raptors, that's brutal. Everything moves in super slow motion. Tick, 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 tick. And during the Jurassic era, we find many examples of... It's only when the bell rings, finally, that time starts moving again. I fly out of the science lab, ditch my notebook, and head straight for the gym. Hey! You know what time it is? Bayback time. Randy's sort of hard to understand with his nose wrapped up like a pound of ground beef, so I'll translate. He just told me it's payback time. 
Guess he thinks he's got the better team. As if we're going to hammer you guys. Especially with Gina out of the lineup. There she is, talking to Coach. I've got to hand it to her. She promised not to play, and she hasn't. She invents a different excuse for every game. Coach, I, um, think I came down with a case of food poisoning. Hmm, food poisoning. That's a new one. And today's lunch was so disgusting, it's 100% believable. Earlier today. Ugh, meatloaf. Is it supposed to be green? Nice job, Gina. But enough about her. We've got a game to win. There's only one problem. Pow! Randy slams my very first pitch way up on the back wall. If a ball hits below the home of the Bobcats banner, it's a double. If it hits above the banner, like Randy's hit, it's a home run. Rats! Randy showboats around the bases, a huge grin on his face. When he reaches home, he jumps on the plate like he just landed on the moon or something. Ta-da! What a jerk. Here's the good thing about fleece ball, though. There's a lot of scoring. Falling behind 1-0 isn't the end of the world, because you'll probably catch up. And we do. After one inning, it's 2-1 Cuddle Kittens. Then it's 4-2 Raptors. Then 5-4 Cuddle Kittens. And then 6-5 Raptors. You get the idea. It's back and forth the whole game. We reach the ninth inning, tied 9-9. And look who's up. Come on, Randy! Slam it, Randy! I hate to admit it, but Randy's a tough out. He's already gotten three hits today. He always hits the ball hard, so it catches me a little by surprise when... Boop! He dribbles a soft ground ball towards Francis at first base. Ha! Easy play! Francis scoops it up, I run over to cover the bag... And then it happens. Payback time. Stomp! It feels like my foot just exploded. Randy and I both hit the floor. He gets up right away. But I don't. I'm too busy rolling around in total agony. Sorry, Nade. It was an accident. It's okay, Randy, says Coach. These things happen. What? These things happen? Uh, yeah, whenever Randy's around. I thought Coach was smarter than that. Can't he see that Randy went for my foot on purpose? It's not broken, Coach says, but it's already starting to swell. Francis and Teddy help me over to the bleachers, and Coach brings me an ice pack. No more fleece ball for you today, Nate, he says. The Cuddle Kittens will have to finish the game with only eight players. Not necessarily, chirps Chad. If Gina plays, we'll have nine. Gina! Yoo-hoo! What? Chad, are you insane? No! I shout immediately. Uh, Gina can't play. She's horrible. I mean, uh, she feels horrible. She's got, um, food poisoning. Coach gives me a funny look, then turns to Gina. Your team could use your help, Gina. Are you well enough to play? She stares straight at me. I'll play! Fantastic! says Coach. Fan what? Apparently, Coach doesn't realize how unfantastic this is. In fact, this could be a complete disaster. Excuse us a sec, Coach. Quick strategy conference, all right? I say to Gina. What are you trying to pull? Nothing, she smirks. Just filling in for an injured teammate. Oh, that's a riot. Listen, Gina, you're not exactly Miss Fleeceball. You could cost us the game. Well, maybe I'll help us win. Did you ever think of that? Is she serious? Dream on, Gina, I snort. Before she can bite my head off, Coach interrupts. Enough talk, you two, he says. Let's play ball. As Gina walks out to right field, I can hear some of the Raptors laughing. I'm starting to get a really bad feeling about this. At first, things go okay. The Raptors load the bases, but we manage to get two outs. All we need is one more to keep the score tied. Don't hit it to Gina. Don't hit it to Gina. Don't hit it to Gina. They hit it to Gina. Whack! Yep! One run scores. Two run score. Eleven nine Raptors. We get the third out of the next pitch, but the damage is done. Thanks, Gina. Dice catch, butterfingers! We still have one more chance to bat. The good news is, Teddy and Francis reach base with two outs. 
The bad news is, here comes out number three. Come on, Gina, you can do it! Earth to Chad, no, she can't. Strike one. Strike two. See? Her stuffed cat would have a better chance of getting a hit. This is awful. I can't just sit here and watch us lose. I've got to do something. Sub, my foot feels... Ow! A lot better now. Ow, ouch! I'll take the bat, Gina. Hand it over. She's speechless, but Coach isn't. Sit down, Nate, he barks. He means it. I let go of the broom handle and hobble back to the bleachers. This stinks. I'm the captain of the team, but I'm stuck watching. Here it comes. The final pitch of the game. Pow! For a few seconds, the gym is completely silent. Then... Home run! Screams Chad. We won, Nate! We won! I don't say anything. I'm in shock. It's not until Coach walks toward us with the spoffy that I actually believe my eyes. Congratulations, cuddle kittens, he says. Then he hands the trophy to... Gina? What's up with that? She plays one inning and all of a sudden she's Joe All-Star? Oop, hold it. She's walking over here. Maybe she realizes that the team captain should get the spoffy. Let's hear what she's got to say for herself. You're welcome. Ouch, that was cold. She struts out, holding up the spoffy like she's the Statue of Liberty. What an amazing game! I hear Chad tell her. Someone should write a story about it! Hmm. Someone will. Chapter 12 Poor Nate's Sports Rap Cuddle Kittens Win Spoffy Led by Team Captain Nate Wright, the Cuddle Kittens, real name Psycho Dogs, beat Randy Betancourt's Raptors in yesterday's Fleece Ball Championship, 12-11. A lucky hit in the ninth inning enabled the Cuddle Kittens to come back from a two-run deficit. Lucky hit? I spin around. Gina's reading over my shoulder. Can't a literary genius write in peace? It was a lucky hit, Gina. You swung with your eyes shut. You just hate that I saved us from losing, she snarls. Oh, really? I ask her. You mean like I saved us from failing the Ben Franklin project? That was different, she says, her voice rising. I did the real work. All you did was draw your stupid little comics. Stupid? My comics aren't stupid, Gina, I shoot back at her. Which you'd know if you'd spent a little time studying them. What? Studying? She sputters. Who are you to lecture me about studying? You know nothing about studying. You've never studied a day in your life. Ahem. M Mrs. Hickson, Gina says. Shouting is not permitted in the library, Gina, Mrs. Hickson says. She pulls out a little pink pad. Report to the detention room after school. Gina gasps. The, the detention room? It's across the hall from the faculty lounge, I say helpfully. She points at me, looking totally outraged. You're the one who should go to detention. Me? All I'm doing is sitting here writing my almanac, just like Ben Franklin. Stop comparing yourself to Ben Franklin, she hisses at me. You're nothing like him. Oh, I don't know about that. Ben and I have a lot in common. I'll bet if he were alive today, he and I would get along pretty well. I think he'd get a real charge out of me. The End